Freedom in Christ. I hope uh, you're doing well around the world during this coronavirus. Tough time. Something like that, a pandemic covering this whole world. Tonight we're going to look at a big scope of history and uh, try to understand from God's perspective the world that we live in and who the God of this world really is and how all that fits into the scheme of things and then narrow it down to one ugly aspect of that and that is about those who've actually been suffering at the hand of true hardcore underground Satanists and have been ritually abused. If we start from the beginning again, it's very important to realize the concept of the seed that is sown. Uh, when God come to Satan after the fall, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. It's a graphic picture in one sense, because a snake is like a hump, and uh, you, could, you push down one hump of it, and another one comes up, and you just have this constant, never-ending battle. But if you can strike the head, then it's dead. And, and that's, that's a prophecy that God gave us at that time, looking ahead, beginning at the woman, initially of Eve, and then on, of course, to Mary, the final seed. What What can be so easily overlooked is when you read the Gospels and you start with Matthew and so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so, and you kind of go, good grief, you know, skip that and move on. Now, they're there for a very, very important and vital reason. Uh, what God intended to do was to establish his children on this earth to have dominion over this earth. When they sin, they die spiritually, separated from God. God never gave up on that plan. Someday, that would all return again. They would have dominion on this planet. And so we read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, the genealogy is traced back that, and Matthew's is a little different from Luke, and I think for a very special reason. The intention of, of Matthew was to present Jesus as the Messiah, the one who has the right to sit upon the throne of David. And uh, much of Matthew illustrates that by showing the superiority of Jesus over the elements, over disease and over demons, and, and to establish him as the true Messiah. Whereas Luke traces it all the way back to the beginning. And I think the, the intention there is, and very specifically the intention, was to show you that the Messiah came from the original Son of God. And uh, so you would read in Luke chapter thing that he was the son of Joseph and the son of so and so and so. And finally gets back to the son of Adam. Now, I would pretty well guess that if I ask any reader of the Bible today, does the genealogy end there? It seems like that's what he wanted to do, trace him back to Adam. But listen to the actual ending of that verse. The son of Adam, the son of God. Again, let me emphasize what I brought out last week. The wheat and the tares are, the wheat are the sons of God. The tares are the sons of the evil ones, sown there by the devil. And then we looked uh, briefly at John, 1 John chapter 3. And uh, for this message, which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. For what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. So how will you know the difference? By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. And so you have this division between the wheat and the tares. Let me just emphasize again that when God called me into this thing, my whole intention was try to find answers for people's problems and, and to come up with a holistic answer. You, you can't deal 
with people and, and look at all as one dimension, as only a psychological being or only a physical being or only a spiritual being. There's a holistic unity in everything that God creates. And, and if you really want to help, you know, God's creation, then you have to deal with it as an entire entity. And you can't help people overcome their psychological problems and their physical problems and ignore the reality of the spiritual world. And, uh, well, that led, you know, really came out of uh, the bondage breaker and victory over darkness and the steps to freedom in Christ, which have gone all over the world, as you know. Uh, but then he took me through two years of just a crash course on hardcore Satanism. I wasn't looking for that. It was all brought to me. And, uh, and I know now, in hindsight, looking back, that before I ever went public, I mean, God wanted me to see this because I was going to run across it all across the nation. We'll get to that in a moment or so. And uh, so finally, I kind of sensed this release. It was, it was just the perfect setup because I was probably content at that time to say, I'll just stay on campus and, and help people. But I, I wanted to perfect what I was doing, and I wanted to see that it wasn't unique to one particular person or this part of it. I wanted this to be able to be understood in terms of the general population. And so for five years, I never left campus with anything about it. Then I, I got an invitation by a church, and I said, you know, I was moonlighting there, uh, Sunday morning, they wanted me to be the pastor. I couldn't do that. There was a time my wife was going through one of the darkest periods of her life, and I just couldn't do that to her. And uh, we were dirt poor, and they were offering me some incredible money, but I, I just couldn't do it. And uh, so uh, I came to them. I said, would you be interested in trying something? What I was teaching at the seminary and seeing God set people free, I said, uh, what if we did it Sunday night? for two sessions every Sunday night, so from five to seven, and then all day Saturday after five weeks. And, uh, well, they loved the idea, and we had an incredible turnout. And uh, But every night that I would talk, the music director would introduce me, sing a couple songs, and leave with his wife. It was very obvious to me. And uh, so even did that on Saturday. They would sing a song and leave. And... Uh, and I never did get an explanation at the time, but then they called me the next week and said, can we come talk to you? Well, sure, come on by. And uh, it turned out they weren't leaving. What they were doing is they were going back to his office and listening. And uh, so here's my first public presentation on resolving personal and spiritual conflicts, living free in Christ. We've changed names for it. And I had two people who had been ritually abused. And when I heard their story, it was, it was almost unbelievable, to be honest with you. I mean, I come from the cornfields of southern Minnesota. I mean, I was a farm boy. I said, is this really going on around the country? And uh, I really stayed connected with them because they, I can't even, I, I don't even feel it's right to tell their whole story. Uh, but a remarkable couple and, and a remarkable testimony to the grace of God that they survived what they went through. Uh, and, and they filled me with a lot of data. And, and they're sitting there telling me their story. And I look and I said, good grief, what were you thinking when I came and presented what I was? And they said, we were overwhelmed by what you shared. And uh, they said, hey, from our experience, you, you're right on. Well, that was encouraging to hear. And all of that, in hindsight, I look back now, it was an incredible preparation for me as I started to go across the country and do my conferences. We would, used to be a week long. I start Sunday morning and Sunday night and all week long and all day Saturday for the general population. Then I would have an advanced seminar on, on Thursday and Friday. And let's say there was 100 people that showed up for that. Almost a third of them were like pastors and counselors who were dealing with people who had been ritually abused. And uh, the most common long-term side effect of that is they end up with what they call DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. It used to be called multiple personalities. And everybody was scratching their head, how do we deal with this? How, how do we help these people? I mean, there, there is no instant cure for that, I'll just be honest with you. But people who literally have been forced into satanic rituals that 
from everything I've heard, meet from midnight to three in the morning and uh, are subjected to horrendous atrocities. Almost a lot of it is just absolutely banging, ripping, violating sex, to be honest with It's like a sex orgy. And, uh, and it culminates at three in the morning. And this couple really explained that to me because I always wondered, what in the world is with three o'clock in the morning? And he said, well, you've been targeted. And if I, I've explained it earlier. I said, every time I did a public conference the uh, night before, three o'clock in the morning, I'd wake up with this kind of a terror attack and learn how to deal with it. And I shared with you how. But uh, what, what is interesting, when you look at the temptation of Jesus, the third temptation, Satan said, I will give you the kingdoms of this world. That was not on hollow offering. He is the God of this world. Jesus said that. What he wanted him to do, however, is if he would worship him, he would, okay, I'll give you back the kingdoms. But without the cross and the resurrection. And God said, no, I'll worship him and get up, be gone, Satan. Uh, truth of the matter is, had he given in to that temptation and acknowledged him and worshiped him, the kingdom still would have been under the domain of of Satan. Uh, but what God had committed himself to was the dominion that was given to Adam and Eve is what he is going to restore and had to preserve that seed all the way through the Old Testament into the New. And think of the times that Satan tried to stop that seed and began with Moses, for instance, where all the two-year-olds were killed and God miraculously preserved Moses. Or Herod, the so-called great, great evil man, is what he was, killed all the children who were two and under trying to preserve again and, 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 and stop somehow or another that, uh, the coming of the Messiah. Well, it was doomed to failure, of course, and we are the result of that today. But the concept of being a child of God goes way beyond the sense that God is my father, I'm his child, isn't that wonderful to know? It is, by the way. Uh, even if it never went beyond that, just knowing who you are in Christ and learning to live as a child of God, that nobody can, can uh, uh, take that away from you and nobody can keep you from being the person God created you to be, which is the core of my message. But it goes beyond that. Uh, it goes far beyond that. Because when we are to pray that heaven would come on earth as it is in heaven, things on earth as it is in heaven, is a kind of a praying for the coming kingdom of God. Right now, it really reigns in the hearts of his children, but someday it will be on earth and uh, still yet future. So all of this, in one sense, is, is prophetic looking ahead. Now, getting back to some specific cases of this, uh, before I left the campus, the campus security director at Bailey University called me one day and said, I'm a, a member of the uh, Campus Security Association of California. I don't know th anything about it, but it's a bunch, a collection of people who are responsible for security in their campuses. It's not a Christian organization. Uh, they meet once a month and just talk about problems on campus, etc. So uh, he asked, it was his turn to, to offer it to uh, on our campus, and so he was going to sponsor it, and he wanted me to come speak on it. And I said, what do you want me to speak on? He said, Satanism. What? <laughs> I hadn't even left the campus yet, you know, with this message. And he wanted to speak on Satanism to a bunch of ex-military people who are responsible for campus security. You know, most of them probably don't have a clue what Christianity is or anything else. And, and I, I really pushed him on it. I said, Satanism? You want me to talk on Satanism? You know, I said, well, okay. So I came and I couched it in Americanism and patriotism and all kinds of things like that. But 10 minutes into my talk, they all started to kind of raise their hand. I was the one who was going to be educated that day. Everyone in that room was regularly finding uh, remains of sacrifices on campus. Every one of them. I said, really? Uh, some kind of rituals, sacrifices, animal sacrifice? I said, how come we're not hearing this? It's all hushed up, they said. I said, did you tell your superiors? Oh, yeah, sure. What did they say? 
Keep it quiet. Clean up the mess. It's actually kind of the same concept of why you never hear honest reporting of, of rapes on campus. If you find out a certain college has a number of rapes, they don't want to publicize that. Nobody would send their daughters to that campus. And so they offer safety patrols and mans and escorts if they needed it, et cetera, and tell people to be concerned. But uh, that was another one amazing to me. So I looked at our campus security director at Biola University, and I said, well, not here, right? He looked at me. Why do you think I asked you? Are you kidding me? I mean, I was just totally surprised, to be honest with you. I said, where? Down by the tennis courts? Oh, for crying out loud. I mean, I was just getting my feet wet at the time as well. But let me give you a couple illustrations of this. One stands out very particular to me because this young lady became very personal to, me, to uh, myself and my wife at the time. Uh, I was doing a conference at a church, a Baptist church in the L.A. area. And uh, this, uh, I would say she was in her late 30s at that time, uh, attended it. And it turned out she was the daughter of a previous pastor. And uh, she got less than 10% of what I talked, and I could just tell that immediately, that she is really, really in bondage. And so I said, get what you can, and I'll meet with you on Monday. And uh, she had actually been seeing counselors for 20 years. And when she came to see me, she actually brought her counselor, had been, she'd been seen for seven years, actually, at that time. Nice guy. Didn't have a clue, bless his heart, of what she was struggling with. And so they were obviously getting nowhere. But he was offering encouragement and kindness so they would come and, you know, but no resolution of anything. And um, so after I heard her story, uh, she really didn't have hardly any memory below 19. And the one thing that she's been struggling with all of these years was that a counselor, when she was 19, had actually sexually abused her. Nothing probably demonic or anything else. It's just a, a leech and violated one of his counselees and raped her. And uh, and so he went on trial and he was a thing, but, but it left her with this, how do I resolve this? How do I live with this kind of pain in my life? Well, we've helped a lot of people get over rapes and violations like that, and it doesn't take all that long, not, certainly not 20 years, and so is there something else going on here? Well, I said, uh, let's see if we can resolve this. I said, would you like to do that? She said, okay. So we started through the steps of freedom. And uh, in those days, in the, in the first step, at the end of it, we have some satanic ritual abuse things. And uh, I had enough experience with that at that time, dealing with people who had been ritually abused, and I began to realize what was going on. And so they just kind of worked down a segment. I renounce, uh, sign my name over to Satan. I announce that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I, I renounce any ceremony or where I've been wed to Satan. I announce that uh, I'm the bride of Christ. And that's still in our steps, by the way. It's in appendix now. And it's a way that we check things out with people. And if we suspect that there's something like that in their past, we'll just have them read down it. And if there's no interference, just stop. You don't even have to finish it. There's nothing there. But if there is something there, <laughs> hold on. I mean, uh, uh, there will be some major, major resistance uh, to that. And uh, so anyway, I just said, well, let's just start this. Well, immediately she just blocked up. And uh, so I had to stop f for a moment and, and help her because she actually went, I think, catatonic initially. And I look at somebody like that, I said, saying, you have no authority here. You can open your eyes. And she opened her eyes. And and, um, and we tried a couple other times, but there was, she just, there's no way that she could have read through that at that time. And so I said, you know, I hate to say this, honey, but you've been ritually abused. And she was kind of shocked at that. And, uh, and so was the counselor, for that matter. I mean, he didn't deny it. Yeah, but it was obvious to him that there was something there he had never even remotely accessed before. Well, that set off quite a journey, quite a learning journey for me. Uh, found out later, you know, the troublesome thing to me at that time was, was I knew her dad. And, uh, and I said, let's make sure that what we're dealing with here 
really happened. And that, so we're not dealing with some false memory or something that Satan is and, and the demons aren't just trying to get us to believe a lie. So she actually went back to places. When memories started to come back, she would actually go back and, and check that out. Yep, that's what it was. And, and, um, and her dad just said, I don't know anything about that. I mean, how in the world could that have happened? And she had three siblings, and they kind of looked at her strangely too. And then her dad did say one to her, well, we did come into your room one time, and you were sitting there with the lights out, with candles all around you. I said, well, there's probably a clue. But it was such a learning experience for me at that time, because as we would try to seek to resolve something, suddenly a different personality would come forward. One was rather outstanding. As soon as she would switch a personality, if you've never seen this before, let me just be blunt with you. It's like you're looking at one human being in one moment, and the next moment you're looking at a completely different human being talking to a different, completely human being. There's only one person here, by the way, so don't ever forget that. Uh, but this one particular personality would immediately get out of her chair and go sit on the floor and, and kind of cover her head. It's too light in here. It's too bright. And I sat there and watched her pupils dilate. That's incredible. I said, uh, it shouldn't happen with the light that was there, but it just was absolutely amazing to see that. And what happens is the brain just switches to that memory in her life and, the, and what's happening. And obviously the abuse was taking place in a dark room. And, uh, and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm your friend. And from that time on, when that little personality came forward, hi, Mr. Friend. Uh, this particular lady was married, had three children, and uh, she had a personality that was, I would just say, bordered on brilliant. Uh, she would actually go down and work at a crisis pregnancy center and she was probably considered their best counselor. She had another personality that was kind of like the mother and the wife at home. And then she had another rather morbid personality that was just like, whew, whatever. What, what makes this story so incredibly unique for me was I was doing a conference in Strasbourg, France, and I had to go from there to Black Forest Academy, which is in southern Germany, and there was a lady who came to the conference and had asked if she could drive me back to the academy, and uh, which was fine with me, you know. And the reason that she came to it and wanted to drive me back, she was a childhood friend of this lady. I said, are you kidding me? I've never had that happen before. I've never had somebody from their past come back and say, I knew her during that time. And yeah, we were like best friends. She said, I never saw anything like that. I said, well, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it in anybody sitting in your church either. Uh, I said, what you would see is somebody who all of a sudden seemed rather moody. Uh, you wouldn't have seen it as they just changed personalities, but they would appear very moody. Like all of a sudden, whew, just switch. And uh, you're talking to a different person. And then I had an undergraduate student at Biola that I did the premarital counseling for and her husband and real nice couple and whatever. And when I gave her a kind of a psychological test uh, and she just really showed up bad in that. And it was just such a surprise to me that I wanted to talk to her alone. And that led off to a whole series of, of meetings with her. And eventually one day I was looking at her and I said, I'm not talking to you right now, am I? And she just goes darn like it there. And uh, uh, believe me, folks, these people really need our prayer. I mean, what they have been subjected to, what they go to. I said, why can't they remember anything like that? I said, it's a severe defense mechanism, I believe. And others agree with me on that, I think. Uh, what they are experiencing and seeing is so absolutely ugly and horrendous that God allows them to dissociate. We all have that capacity, by the way. I remember a number of times where I'm sitting there studying and the kids are fighting in the other room. And I've just tuned it out. And my wife would say, honey, why don't you do something to the kids? What? Is there something wrong? And all of a sudden I'm listening. 
Uh, you know, if you didn't have that capability of doing that, you couldn't study, you couldn't read, every little noise would distract you. So you multiply that times about, that irritation times about a thousand, and you know where they're coming from. And so, uh, boy, if your heart goes out to anybody, it goes out to these people. What they're going through is just just horrendous. And uh, uh, I, I was a caregiver for two or three like that, and I, then God just moved me on. I said, this is going to take the rest of my life. Or God, I believe, has called me to preach the gospel and go to churches and, and help the general population. And so I had to finally say no to that. And uh, But to, to stand by and support those who are doing the best they can to try to help them is the role that God has given me. But I wanted you to know, it is out there. I ran across it all across our countries. I mean, I was so shocked doing a conference in, in Ames, Iowa. I said, here, in the cornfields of Iowa? I mean, that was the kind of like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, so there are seminars in this, and there's books on it and whatever else. It, what's interesting to me, the second world is coming into this, and they have no answer. <laughs> and I actually heard one guy who's not a Christian and didn't want to become a Christian. He said, I think somehow the church should be involved in this, but I don't know how, and probably didn't really care either for that matter. By the way, let me just share a story that this one I was telling you about wrote me and gave me to me as a Christmas present one year. And she just captured the gospel in such a powerful way. I want to share it with you. While on vacation as a child one year, I happened upon a gold watch that I had noticed was lying on the ground. It was covered with dirt and gravel and was face down in the parking lot of our motel. At first glance, it did not seem worth the effort to bend down and pick it up. But for some reason, I found myself searching for it anyway. The crystal was broken, the watch band was gone, and there was no moisture on the dial. From all appearances, there was no logical reason to believe this watch would still work. Every indication was that its next stop would be the trash can. Those in my family who were with me at the time laughed at me for picking it up. My mother even scolded me for holding such a dirty object that was so obviously destroyed. As I reached for the winding stem, my brother made comment as to my lack of intelligence. It's been run over by cars, he chided. Nothing can endure that kind of treatment. As I turned the stem, the second hand of the watch began to move. My family was wrong. Truly, odds were against the watch working, but there was one thing no one thought of. No matter how broken the outside was, if the inside was not damaged, it would still run. And indeed, it did. It kept perfect time. This watch was made to keep time. Its outside appearance had nothing to do with the purpose for which it was designed. It's true of you and me, by the way. Although the appearance was damaged, the inside was untouched in perfect condition. 25 years later, I still have that watch. I take it out every once in a while, wind it up, still works. I think as long as the inside remains untouched, it always will. However, unless I had bothered to pick it up and tried to wind it years ago, I never would have known the part of the watch that really mattered was still in perfect condition. Although it looks like a piece of junk, it will always be a treasure to me because I look beyond the outside appearances and believe in what really mattered, its ability to function in the matter for which it was created. Thank you, Neil and Joanne, for making the effort to pick up the watch and turn the stem. You're helping me to see that my emotions may be damaged, but my soul is in perfect union with God, and that is what was created to be with him, the only permanent part, the part that really matters. I know that deep within my heart, no matter what my feelings are telling me, this is true. I also believe that with the help of God's servant, even the casing can be repaired, and maybe even that will become functional again. It has. It has. She has found her freedom in Christ, and she is whole and complete in Christ. When you read your Bible... You saying is this really true with this man sharing that there's a God of this world and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one? I'm taken right out of Scripture, by the way. I said, absolutely, yes. And uh, remember this, that Satan is the God of the dead, spiritually dead. Jesus is the God of the living. But there are a hierarchy, a demonic structure out there ruling over what people sometimes call territorial spirits, over every region of the world. I believe that, I know it, I've seen the results of that. But you know what's really interesting, and I was just thinking today, I said, when you read your Bible, have you ever asked the question, 
What about me? What about the common man, the guy who's the farmer and the plumber and the engineer? The Bible seems to only be about kings and princes and prophets and false prophets and true prophets. And that's kind of true. He said, well, I guess there's Ruth. But even Ruth, as, as a book, was really an, a critical cog in the seed that was so leading to Christ and also set up the whole concept of the kinsman redeemer. But you say, what about the common man? And uh, what about you and me, you know, living in this world? What does scripture have to say about that? Well, I think, oddly enough, if you look again at a passage I'm sure you're familiar with, when Joshua had actually gone in and conquered the promised land, near the end of his life, he gives a little speech and he recounts how God called Abraham out of Ur and, and, and delivered the nation from Egypt and all that type of thing. And then he concludes by saying, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away, now listen to this, the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a choice. You can serve God or mammon. You serve God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You're a child of God. You're seated with Christ in the heavenlies, the right hand of God. People, I read the last chapter of this book. We win. We're on the winning side of this issue. There's nothing here to fear. But going back again to the wheat and the tares, it's a very discouraging thing to me when he lays it out that it's like the kingdom of heaven. And while the wheat was sleeping, the tares came in and sowed. We can't be asleep during this time. We need to be alert, be a sober spirit, for the devil is roaring around like a hungry lion seeking for someone to devour. Much of my ministry has helped people overcome the effects of the evil one. And uh, much of what I do, I think, is captured uh, in a testimony I just came by the email, I think today or yesterday, it says, uh, Dr. Anderson, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. 20 plus years ago, I had my first major encounter with spiritual warfare. I had been targeted by a man who was possessed. Being raised in a Southern Baptist family, I was wholly unaware with anything to do with the spiritual realm. My family assumed that I was losing my mind when I described what became daily manifestations of evil. The psychological, physical, emotional, and spiritual damage inflicted on me during those years left me devastated on every level. I was eventually forced to flee my marriage to protect myself and my children. It was then that I found your books. They became a crucial part of my healing and eventually my return to faith in God. One of the often repeated phrases from various counselors I've seen through the years is, no one who endured what you did should be functioning. I've always cited the truth revealed in your work as a primary reason I could fight through the darkness and back to the light. A few years after the divorce, I returned to school and received my MA in biblical literature. I now write, podcast, and work with other people who have been in similar circumstances. None of that would have been possible if I had not a, such a clear and accessible lifeline as you provided. 20 years later, I still recommend your books to others who are also using your work to fight their way back to light. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for listening. We're going to talk about the protection God has provided to us, the armor of God. Uh, what is God's perspective on our world today? We're going to bring that up. So we're going to continue this series for a while and take a look at false teachers and false prophets, which are going to plague I'm afraid the church in the end times, these people will rise from amongst us. And if we are not discerning, we may miss it. And, uh, and there would be great damage. So let me pray for you as we close tonight. Father, I just pray for all those who are listening. And pray just as Jesus did. I ask not that you take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. 
Sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. Keep them from the evil, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.